Our sermon text for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. And I'll begin reading in verse 37. We're going to read verses 37 through 45. Luke chapter 9. And I'll begin reading in verse 37. On the next day when they, and that's talking about Jesus, James, Peter, and John, had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met Jesus. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father, and all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand the saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about the saying. This is God's word. And uh, today we continue in our study on Sunday mornings in the Gospel of Luke. We, We plan to be in this Uh, study until the week after Easter Sunday, which is April 11th, so several more weeks in this study, and we come this morning to this terrifying account of a father who comes to Jesus in desperation because his son's life is being torn apart. This boy is the man's only child, and Luke often highlights where an only child's life is in danger. We saw it back in Luke chapter 7 where the only son of the widow from the city of Nain, he died. We saw it just a few weeks ago in Luke chapter 8, where the only daughter of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, died. And then again today in chapter 9, we see where the only son, and indeed the only child, it says, of this father is afflicted by a demon. Now, obviously demon possession is something you'd never take lightly, But even among demonic possession, this one stands out. Because the father says in verse 39, a spirit seizes him, he suddenly cries out, it convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. So the seizures caused by this possession doesn't just make him fall down. The boy is thrown down and smashed against the ground with great force. It's like the boy is in a new car accident every day. And each blow leads to some new trauma in the boy's body. Another concussion, another loss of consciousness, another bruise, another broken bone. And you know the father is just thinking, how much more can my son take? And with each violent smashing, the father's heart is broken all over again. And you you parents know what this is like. There is no worse pain than seeing your children suffer, and there's nothing you can do about it. You would gladly take places with them, uh, trade places with them, but you can't. And so you're helpless and almost hopeless as you watch your child suffer. But this man, at least he does the right thing, because he believes there's one physician in Israel who can help his son. Teacher, he says to Jesus in verse 39, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. The man does the right thing, does he not? He takes his son to Jesus. Yet Jesus' response, and that's what I, what, I, what I couldn't get away from this week as I was thinking about this text. It's his response that is curious. Because Jesus does not respond to this father at all like you would expect. Or at least I would. Whenever you're reading through the Gospels and Jesus does something or says something that surprises you, that doesn't make any sense to you at first glance, camp out there because you'll learn something. 
Those are always important markers as you read through the Gospels. And the something we can learn this morning is a lesson on faith. We can learn two powerful things about Christian faith from this text. And I'll divide it up like this. First of all, we'll look at the question of faith. And then second, the answer for faith. Really complicated today. The question of faith and the answer for faith. So first, the question, what is it that Jesus says that is surprising, to me anyway, maybe not to you, but to me, or seems out of place, was verse 41. Oh, faithless and twisted generation. Some translations have perverse. How long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. Now, doesn't that seem weird to you? That's, you know... You've got a man here begging for Jesus to heal his son, and Jesus responds and replies in what seems like an unnecessarily harsh manner. I read that, and I, you know, my first response was to say, my goodness, if somebody came to me and begged me to heal their critically ill son and I could actually do it, I would say, of course, let's take care of this right now. Bring your son here. We'll get it done. What I wouldn't do is rebuke someone for asking for my help. I wouldn't say, how long am I going to have to put up with you? But that's what Jesus says. Why? Well, what you've got to see is, Jesus is not addressing the Father in verse 41. He's not rebuking the Father. Again, the Father did exactly what he was supposed to do. Jesus is rebuking another group of people. Who's he talking to here? Let's look back at verse 40. The father comes to Jesus and says, and I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus is not rebuking the disciples. He is rebuking, he's not rebuking the father, rather. He is rebuking his disciples, or at least some of them. Jesus and three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, they were on the mountain the day before. And they come down to find the other nine of the twelve disciples Unable to help this boy. And Jesus is frustrated with them. He is frustrated because the disciples are faithless. That's what he says in verse 41. Oh, faithless and twisted generation. He is frustrated because the disciples do not have the faith to cast the demon out of this boy. That's why he's angry. Now, do you know... Okay, before any of that's going to make sense to you, you've got to know one thing. Do you know what faith is? Because there is an awful lot of misunderstanding when it comes to the subject of faith in Christian circles today. A lot of people, including professing Christians, talk about faith as if it's some kind of spiritual power out there in the universe and you can tap into it. They talk about it as if by simply believing certain things strongly enough, you can do things that other normal human beings can't do. Okay, faith is this spiritual power out there you can tap into. You just believe something strong enough, you can do things other people can't do. But I want you to know that is not what the Bible talks about when the Bible talks about faith. Do you know what that is? It's the Force from Star Wars. Remember that? Remember the movies? Of course you do. How can you not remember Star Wars? And there's a scene in the first Star Wars movie where Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker are on the Millennium Falcon. They're they're going to Alderaan. And Obi-Wan begins Luke's training to become a Jedi. And uh, there's this robot that floats around on the Millennium Falcon and it shoots lasers at Luke and Luke's using his lightsaber, you know, to block the lasers so he doesn't get stung by them. And Obi-Wan stops him and says, you're doing it all wrong, Luke. Don't trust your eyes. They can deceive you. A Jedi can feel the force flowing through him. Let go of your conscious self and act on instinct. Stretch out your feelings, Luke. Now, that's what a lot of Christians apparently think faith is. Stretch out your feelings. Let go of your conscious self. And you can change things out there in the physical universe. You know, I can remember back to when I was a kid. And I thought 
that's what the Bible meant by faith. I mean, I knew Matthew 17, 20, where Jesus says, For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. I knew that verse, but I didn't know when I was a kid that moving mountains was a common Jewish metaphor for doing impossible things, and Jesus was not training his disciples in that moment on how to levitate physical objects. But having been influenced by Star Wars, there was a time when I resolved to try to put this kind of faith into practice, and I remember it vividly. I was on the couch in the house I grew up in watching television. I wanted to change the channel. But the remote control was way on the other side of the room, like six feet away from me. And I didn't want to get up and have to walk all the way over there to grab it, so I reached out my hand to the remote control. Just as I'd seen Luke Skywalker do many times in the movie, and I used the Obi-Wan Kenobi translation of Matthew 17, 20. If you stretch out your feelings and say to the remote control, move from here to there, it will move. And I know this will shock you, but the remote control did not move. Now why? Because that's not what biblical faith is. So what is it? And you've got to know this, if, you're going to understand, if it's going to make any sense why Jesus was mad at his disciples. Biblical faith is simply believing what God has said. That's it. Believing what God has said. And the reason Jesus is so frustrated with the disciples is because they did not believe something he had said. Now what specifically had Jesus told the disciples that had direct bearing on this situation with this particular demon? And it's Luke chapter 9 verse 1. And Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons. When the disciples went around all of Israel driving out demons, it, they did not do so because they stretched out their feelings and, and, and were able to cast the demons out. They did not cast demons out because they believed so strongly they could do it or because they tapped into some secret power in the universe that gave them an ability that other regular people didn't have. They drove demons out because Jesus gave them the power and authority to do so, and they believed it. And that's it. And there were no exceptions, okay? Which demons, going back to verse 1, which demons did Jesus give the disciples authority over? All demons. This demon with this boy was particularly nasty. The disciples saw how violent it was. They saw the destruction it was causing in this boy's life. And they were intimidated by it. And they thought in their heart of hearts, surely, okay, we're seeing this demon at work. Surely Jesus didn't mean this demon. I mean, Jesus must have forgotten about this demon when he said, you have power and authority over all demons. I'm not sure even Jesus could cast out this demon. In the face of suffering and terror like they'd never experienced before, the disciples lacked faith, and they could not drive out this demon, not because they didn't work up in themselves some kind of super belief, not because they were failing to tap into some secret power in the universe, but just because they didn't believe Jesus when he said, all demons, and that's why he's frustrated. In fact, in Mark's account, we read the disciples were so intimidated by this demon, they didn't even bother to pray about it. Jesus comes, they come later to Jesus and say, why couldn't we cast it out? And he tells them in Mark 9, 29, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. You didn't even pray about it, guys. The disciples didn't even bother to ask Jesus for help in doing what he'd already explicitly commanded them to do. And friends, this is what I want you to know. It is true of us as well. We exhibit our lack of faith all the time by failing to believe what God has explicitly told us in his word. And I'm not talking about healing the sick or casting out demons. 
You know, I have read the Bible, believe it or not, cover to cover many times. And you will not find one place in the Bible where you and I are given the authority to heal the sick the way the twelve had the authority. That is not to say that we should not pray to heal people when they are sick. I happen to have prayed for some people who were sick, and they got better. I've also prayed for some sick people, and God did not see fit to answer that prayer. But my point is that God has not given you and me the direct authority, the way he gave the 12 disciples to heal the sick or cast out demons. He gave them authority and power that he has not yet seen fit to give us. But here is the question of faith. Will we believe in the face of suffering? Suffering that intimidates us and that we think when we see it we can't handle. Will we believe that God is control? God is in control. Will we believe that God is good? Will we believe that even in horrible suffering, God can get the glory? That's the question of faith. Because we have all been explicitly instructed about this in God's word. In God's word, he has said, no temptation has overtaken you. That's not common to man, but God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Will we believe God's word? Will we have faith? Or will we succumb to temptation, saying it's too much for us, whether it's temptation, temptation to engage in illicit sex, or to be greedy with our money, or to lash out in anger at those around us? In his word, God has said, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Will we believe what God has said? Will we humble ourselves and go to God in prayer with our needs because we believe he sees us and we believe he cares for us? Or will we wear ourselves and our loved ones out with our worry? In his word, God has promised us, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Will we believe what God has said? Or will we look at, the, like the disciples, look at suffering that we're about to face that we don't think we can handle. Suffering that intimidates us. That we don't even bother to pray about because we're so intimidated. That threatens to drive us to despair. Will we look at that suffering and say, surely God didn't mean this kind of suffering. He must have forgotten all about this level of pain when he said all things work together for good. I don't think even God meant to include this kind of suffering. Will we believe what God has said or not? That is the question of faith. Now second, the answer for faith. Jesus cast the demon out of the boy. And the boy is saved, reunited to his father. And this should not surprise us because, again, for the third time, the father did nothing wrong. He did exactly what he should do. He set his boy down at the feet of Jesus and trusted Jesus with him. The father knew if anyone, if anyone could help his son, it was Jesus. And as a result, we read in the first part of verse 43, all were astonished at the majesty of God. There, was, there were always crowds around Jesus, and they were, they were saying, we have never seen anybody in this bad of shape restored like this. This is amazing. This can only be the hand of God. All were astonished at the majesty of God. But then, we take a left turn at the end of verse 43 and verse 44. Where we read, but while they were all marveling at everything he was doing. Okay, while, while the crowd is still shouting hallelujah at what Jesus has done. 
Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. Now that is a reference to Jesus' upcoming death. Now again, this is one of those places where if you're reading carefully, you need to ask why. Like It doesn't make sense. Why would Jesus pick that moment when everyone is praising God? Why would he pick that moment to talk to his disciples about his death? And this is what I think the reason is. While the disciples certainly believed that Jesus was the Messiah, they believed he was the Son of God, Jesus knew that just in a few short months, they would see Jesus arrested, tried, mocked, humiliated, and executed. And the disciples would then face the greatest test of their faith they'd ever known. They would, they would, their faith that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, would be severely tested. And they would be tempted to think, surely he wasn't the Son of God after all. I mean, Jesus must not have been a part of God's plan to save Israel if God let Jesus go through something like that. I don't think even God could glorify himself by the death of a man like Jesus. And Jesus is trying to warn them beforehand, beforehand so they'd be ready for it, but they don't understand him because we read in verse 45 they did not understand his saying and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it and they were afraid to ask him about this saying as one commentator puts it the disciples quote have no categories for handling what seems to be a clear contradiction how or will will one how or why will one who has power and authority like Jesus be found in a position of having his life and death determined by others? Whatever views of the Messiah they had held, obviously those views are inadequate for Jesus' words. See, Jesus knows they're going to face this contradiction. How can the Messiah die? And he's trying to warn them beforehand so they don't lose faith, but they don't get it. It's kept from them. But we can understand, can't we? Because we have had the benefit of 2,000 years of Christian teaching that the disciples did not. We can understand that there is no contradiction between Jesus being the Son of God, very God of very God, the Messiah, and also Jesus dying a criminal's death on a Roman cross. We can see those two things and say there's no contradiction. We can look at those two things and say God can be glorified in Jesus being his son and in Jesus dying. Because we know what we are. We know that we are sinners. We know that because we are sinners, we are enemies of God. And we know that because we are enemies of God, his wrath awaits us. But we also know who God is, and he is love. And rather than give us what we deserve, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross in our place. We can see Jesus bearing the wrath of God so that we don't have to. And we can see Jesus dying like a seed going into the ground to give us life so that through us, the Spirit can bear much fruit. We can see all that. We can see there's no contradiction. The disciples couldn't. I pray you can see that. I pray you can see there's no contradiction. Because in John 12, beginning in verse 23, we read, where Jesus says, talking about the cross, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So friends, here is the answer for faith. Are you ready? If you can believe that God can glorify himself and bring good out of the greatest tragedy in human history, the death of his perfect son, then you can believe 
that he will bring good out of whatever temptation, whatever persecution, whatever suffering you face in your life. If he can bring good out of one, if he can glorify himself out of the one, he can bring good and glorify himself out of the other. That's the answer for faith. And so many of you know this personally because you have this faith. You know, I, I have lost count of the number of people who have come to me, including many in this church, and who have gone through something horrible like cancer or adultery or the death of a loved one. And after all that, they've come to me and they've said, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to go through. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, but I thank God for it. Because now I see my sinfulness in a way that I never did before. And now I am closer to God than I've ever been before. And it has enabled me to be kind and loving and compassionate like I never dreamed I could be before. I've heard you tell me that. Johnny Erickson Tata is a uh, Christian speaker and writer. Her books and her talks have helped thousands and thousands over the years. And she's also been a quadriplegic since she dove into some shallow water in the Chesapeake Bay on July 30th, 1967 and broke her neck. Fifty-three years and counting, she has been in a wheelchair. Can we all stipulate that that's suffering? But in one of her books, Johnny writes this. I sure hope I can bring this wheelchair to heaven. Now, I know that's not theologically correct, but I hope to bring it and put it in a little corner of heaven, and then in my new, perfect, glorified body, standing on grateful, glorified legs, I'll stand next to my Savior holding his nail-pierced hands, and I'll say, thank you, Jesus. And he will know that I mean it, because he knows me. He'll recognize me from the fellowship we're now sharing in his suffering. And I will say, Jesus, do you see that wheelchair? You were right when you said that in this world we will have trouble because that thing was a lot of trouble. But the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. And it never would have happened had you not given me the bruising of the blessing of that wheelchair? That's the answer for faith. Now, I'm, please don't misunderstand me when I say Christians have to have faith. I am not saying that your faith has to be perfect, unblemished, without any doubts. For good to come out of your suffering, for God to get the glory out of your suffering. Why do I say that? Because in Mark's account of this event, we read that the father did not even have perfect faith. We read that the father comes to Jesus in Mark 9, 22 and says, But if you can do anything for us, Jesus, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe... Help my unbelief. So here's a father, and he's saying, heal my son. And Jesus says, well, I can if you believe. And the man says, I want to believe, but I don't really believe. I'm trying to believe, but I can't fully believe. I think I believe, but my belief is full of doubts. Help me, Jesus. Now, does Jesus hear the father say all that and say, get a grip? Pull yourself together. I can't deal with you if you're crazy like this, okay? You need to go away and work on your faith. So I've got a six-week program that you can go through to strengthen your faith. And when you come back to me, I don't want to see any doubt in your eyes. I want you to look me straight in the eye and say, Jesus, I believe, and then I'll heal your son. Is that what Jesus does? No, he just heals the man's son. And friends, in the face of suffering and temptation, you think you can't handle. If you will go to Jesus like the Father did, with a faith that is full of doubts, saying, I'm trying to believe, but I can't really believe, 
If you'll do that, he will do the impossible in your life. He will help you see the good, and he will get the glory out of what everybody else says is overwhelming suffering. He will do the impossible in your life. And that's what Matthew 17, 20 is all about. Jesus promises that if you come to him in faith, he will do wonderful things in your life, things that you thought were impossible. He will change you into somebody you did not think you could be, and that change will be so great that it will make moving mountains look like a child building sandcastles on the beach. You will be astonished at the majesty of God. And friends, this is why we are always harping on being in church on the Lord's Day and praying and reading your Bible and having good Christian friends you can process the scriptures with because... That is how God has said your faith will be strengthened. That's how you're going to believe these promises. And it's also why we take the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 11, 26, the Apostle Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I don't know that I ever really thought about that verse until last week. But you know what Jesus is, what Paul is saying there? He's saying every time we come together and we take the Lord's Supper, we are increasing our faith by remembering, by proclaiming the Lord's death, by remembering that God brought the greatest good imaginable out of the worst suffering imaginable. Every time we take the Lord's Supper, we remember that God sent Jesus because he loves us, he sent Jesus because he's good, and he sent Jesus to get the glory. Be astonished, my friends, at the majesty of our God. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your promises to us in Scripture. We, we say in our hearts, we believe, help our unbelief. Help us to set our sufferings and our doubts and our fears at the foot of the cross and believe that you will provide for us and bring good out of circumstances that threaten to overwhelm us. And we now set apart the bread and the cup. And we ask that you bless it so that we might faithfully proclaim Jesus' death until he returns. And we pray this in his name. Amen.